Stan, somewhere in the mountains of West Virginia, now retreating to Georgia. Actually, he doesn't like tree stands. Joe Ferretti, good morning, Joseph. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, I was not in a tree stand, but I was hoofing it uh, for quite a few days in the woods and uh, paying the price now, dealing with a cold. So uh, I'm going to warn you, I'm going to try to use the mute button as best I can if I have to blow my nose. I don't want to do that on the air. You got to do what you got to do, Joe. <laughs> did, did, you, did you get a Bambi to put in your freezer? No, I didn't. Uh, actually, we had a, a nephew of mine hunting, and uh, we were really working hard to try to get him his first deer. So um, it turned out uh, I, I saw nothing in front of me that, that was worth uh, shooting, but we couldn't get him a deer either, so it was not a great season for us. How long were you out there? I did uh, two days in West Virginia, and then I packed up and headed to uh, north central Pennsylvania and enjoyed their first day and second day of buck season up there. So quite a trip. And along that drive, which was, what, about four hours? Uh, from Snowshoe to north central PA? Yeah. Yeah, uh, four, four, four and a half, yeah. How many dead deer along the highway did you pass? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, there's uh you see we call them grease spots uh -huh. <laughs> they're all along the highway uh the states do a good job of picking the deer up of course because they're testing for that chronic wasting disease so they want to pick up as many carcasses as they can to test them you know it's uh it's amazing when the semi hits a deer versus when a car hits a deer like the explosion oh. on the highway if you're not long after is just epic like oh my goodness yeah, it's, it's, kind of sickening in oh. a way uh yeah i think west virginia has uh the distinction of being maybe the worst state in the country for deer car collisions yeah this this area west virginia maryland pennsylvania those three states this time of the year body shops baby body shops <laughs> joe let's talk presidential pardons and this came back in the news obviously recently when president joe biden decided that he would do what I think most of us thought he was going to do anyway, and that was pardoning his son, Hunter. And there were two different charges, uh, as I understand it, uh, for which Hunter has been pardoned, Joe. And if there's more than that, maybe you can get into some detail on that as well. And my understanding also is the time frame was specific for uh, potential crimes or violations that took place between 2014 and 2024. Do I have that accurate as well? Yeah, there's a couple things to unpack there, Rob. Uh, the, the two crimes, uh, specific crimes for which he was pardoned, had to do with the tax evasion and uh, not reporting income to, and, and then lying on tax returns and also then lying on that application for a gun. Uh, he was in drug rehabilitation at the time he applied for the gun permit, yet did not indicate that on his form. So those were the the two specific crimes for which he was pardoned. But uh, what is really causing some controversy is the, the breadth and scope of the pardon. Uh, it's for all crimes committed, including the ones we just referenced, and any other offense committed against the United States going back to the year 2014, which encompasses all that time that he was involved with Burisma and allegedly getting money for uh, no pay jobs and things like that and, and, and really leveraging his family name to get a, a lot of that money uh, to the extent that any of that is criminal uh, and, and the federal offense, he's been pardoned all the way back 10 years. Let's go to the pardons in general. Joe, when did the president get the power to pardon? Do you know? Well, it's it's in Article Two of the Constitution, which deals with the executive branch, uh, the founders, uh, namely Madison and Hamilton, uh, borrowed from old English common law going back to the 1500s and decided that um, uh, they realized that the courts were not going to be perfect. Uh, they're run by human beings, and, and so we they are. There's some imperfection involved with that. So they wanted to vest some authority in the executive to uh, grant pardons or clemency, which is a forgiveness of the, of the punishment, the, the sentence, if you will. Uh, and they embody that in the Constitution. It's Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution gives the president, uh, in the same paragraph, by the way, that appoints him commander-in-chief, it concludes in that paragraph by saying that he shall have the power, he or she, I should say now, have the power to pardon 
and um, and grant clemency in all matters against all offenses against the United States, except for matters of impeachment. There's a specific carve out there that a president cannot pardon someone who's been impeached from a federal office. But uh, any federal offense, the president has that authority. When you perceive a pardon, I think there's different degrees of how people might perceive them. You, you maybe pardon somebody that it appears, as you referenced in the Constitution, that the courts got it wrong. Uh, and the person's already kind of served their time, maybe unjustly. Uh, maybe maybe you got a pardon for someone that you, you think, you know, you're pretty sure the courts did get it right, but maybe the sentence was too strong, and after some period of time, you pardon you and you set that aside. And, and then the, the, there's the pardons we've been seeing a lot lately from the executive branch, which is someone who's probably guilty of what they did, and before they even get to prison, we're going to pardon them so that they don't go. And those are the ones, I think, that get under the skin of people more than the other ones. Yeah. When the pardon power was first exercised, and this was true up through the 1860s, uh, it was typical that an offense be committed against the United States and the person adjudged guilty. In other words, that individual had gone through a court process, had been found to be guilty, either by judge or jury, and sentenced. And then the executive would step in and say, well, we, I, I think this is a miscarriage of justice, or I think the penalty is too stiff, so we're going to grant either a pardon or clemency. What this has morphed into, and this started in the early 1900s and continues to this day, is now – uh, pardons are being granted not only for those adjudged guilty, but those who perhaps have committed offenses, uh, but there's been no court process, and, and but pardons are still being granted. So there, there's been some change in how this power has been exercised, and as we now go through uh, the first Trump administration and the Biden administration, I think you're going to see another ratcheting up, if you will, of the use of this power preemptively. And uh, th therein lies some dangers that we can talk about. But uh, overall, the, the presidential authority has been exercised in different ways than I think was intended by the founders. And after a presidential pardon is issued, is there any additional legal recourse that can be sought to overturn or override a pardon? No. Uh, Congress uh, has no authority over the executive branch in terms of wielding this power. Now, Congress can do a couple things. They can, they can have an oversight committee appointed, and they can review this, and they can come out and say, geez, Mr. or Ms. President, you were a bad person in doing this, and we think this was uh, untoward, and uh, uh, it was not uh, a pardon well granted, and they can kind of scold the president. But there's not much else they can do. To, uh, there's nothing they can do, frankly, to overturn it. The only way Congress could actually affect uh, – the exercise of the pardon power, number one, uh, we know Congress funds um, the Department of Justice and, and in particular some committees that have appointed to review applications for pardons or applications for clemency. Congress has the power of the purse, and they can either fund or, or choose not to fund that as a, as a means of thwarting the executive branch. They won't be successful, but that's – again, it's more symbolic than anything. And the only other thing Congress can do is uh, – Propose a constitutional amendment to uh, directly address Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, which grants this authority. And who can the president pardon or not pardon in terms of forms of crimes or level of courts? Any offense against the United States. So think of this as uh, typically a federal case that's adjudicated in the federal courts or would be adjudicated in the federal courts, starting with the U.S. District Courts up through the courts of appeal and the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, typically, uh, well, almost exclusively, that's where federal cases are, are heard. And uh, those kinds of offenses against the United States are subject to pardons. State cases, in case uh, uh, fans of Donald Trump are wondering about uh, the state case in Georgia or uh, state cases in New York, which we've heard a lot about, uh, not leave recently, but uh, we heard a lot about last summer, uh, those are beyond the pardon power of the president. It only has to do with uh, federal cases. Uh, good morning, Joe. It, it, 
is there a in terms of um so i'll complete a sentence here in a second <laughs> he's a writer <laughs> not a talker <clears throat> so hunter has been pardoned for everything he might have done uh from january 1st 2014 up till the present day so if there is an ongoing investigation into um what trump calls the the you know crime family the biden crime family um he's lost his fifth amendment protections hasn't he uh, he has, in a sense, because he, there, there's no uh, there, there's no threat of a prosecution uh, for anything that might be a federal offense. Now, uh, you know, there, there still could be state offenses involved here, and uh, to, to the extent that Hunter Biden would have any exposure in terms of state tax filings, uh, things of that nature, he still would uh, enjoy some of those protections. But with regard to federal offenses, you're correct. So I'm wondering if that's not you know, from a political perspective. I think nobody's asked me, but I think this is a political disaster for um, the Democrats and for Biden's legacy. And uh, but that's. Oh, I, 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 I agree. I, I think legally, can he do this? Certainly. Uh, should he have done it? Uh, I think history will judge this to be uh, at in the least wrong footed politically, but perhaps even more damaging than uh, we can imagine today because coming out in favor of pardoning his son, he implicated the Department of Justice yep. as being p motivated politically. And uh, that was the, the song and dance of, of uh, former President Trump uh, for, for years. And now we've got <laughs> the, the leader of the Democratic Party uh, singing that same song. So that I, I just think it's uh, very damaging. Even though I get it, you know, if I could, under the same circumstances, you, on the way out the door, you get to pardon your son. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I get it from from a parental perspective, but politically and for the good of the nation, it's I think it's mm -hmm. it's 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 tough. John, you just used the term, uh, and Joe, I want to jump in and just ask the question, you know, at the end of your term, this is when we often hear a lot about a presidential pardon, but can a presidential pardon come at any time during the presidency? Oh, yeah. In fact, uh, Matt, if you recall, in the last days of the Trump administration, there was a flurry of activity regarding pardons and, and that's when pardons were issued to the likes of roger stone and mike flynn and and that crowd uh 60 of donald trump's pardons granted throughout the t his term occurred in the last days of his administration uh, and, and that's one of the things uh that uh, you know george w bush pointed this out when he was walking out the door uh he didn't think the pardon process was working very well and uh, propose some reforms to that. And uh, I, I don't know how you reform it because, again, con Congress has no authority over this. Uh, it would have to be uh, something that the president on his own volition uh, would want to do, and, and I just don't see that happening. Thank you for answering my next question because I wrote down, um, you mentioned earlier it's been changed in how it's been used, so how do we put the cat back in the bag, and you're saying there may not be a way. Well, I, no, I, I don't think there is, uh, short of a, a constitutional amendment. Uh, you know, there could be – look, there, there's going to be an outcry when uh, – if Donald Trump follows through on his promises to pardon these January 6th folks who uh, were tried and convicted, uh, there's going to be another outcry uh, that occurs. And um, I, I don't know at, at what point that becomes politically damaging to – uh, a lame duck president, such as uh, what Donald Trump will be in his last term. But there there are inherent dangers that lurk here with regard to this pardon power, because uh, remember, I talked about how this has morphed into uh, – there's an um, anticipatory aspect to all this that uh, Hunter Biden may have committed crimes going back to 2014, and he's now suddenly pardoned. What would uh, stop a president from coming into uh, a new administration armed with the criminal immunity that, that he or she enjoys themselves due to the Supreme Court decision? What would stop them from immunizing, if you will, uh, some of the cabinet members who, who may be real devotees of, of the president 
and and say, look, if if you are going to commit any crimes here while in office, you enjoy a pardon, and these folks could act with impunity to do a lot of things in conjunction with a president who is also immune. Uh, there's an inherent danger there that um, uh, could really upset the democratic principles that uh, our government has operated under for almost 250 years. Uh, so that's – I think some of the recent Supreme Court decisions and uh, how this pardon power is being used does inherently create a, a lot of risk. This goes – I've mentioned here before the whole idea of of our democratic system, representative republic uh, system, and our sense of justice is based on the idea of trust. That and without the idea of trust, unless we really believe that, that Lady Justice is blind – Everything else goes away. And now we've got both sides of the political aisle are essentially saying the same thing, that the Department of Justice um, is is corrupt. They've got their, their thumb on the scales one way or the other. Uh, I, that's what I fear is the next step. If we, if we actually stop trusting the law enforcement officers, the law enforcement system, the system of justice within the United States, there's not a lot left. You know, if if we lose that level of trust, and I think it is eroding, I think it has eroded a lot over time because I do think the Justice Department has been politicized. Um, unless we can fix that, I, this, is a, this is a real dangerous road we're on. Uh, oh, there, there, there's no simple question. Uh, uh, you know, what, what made me cringe uh, was every time uh, Donald Trump was involved in a court case, he would point out, well, the judge's daughter works for Democratic operatives or – you know, the judge is Mexican, and I, I'm not going to get a fair shake on this. And that has continued now and has now been further supported by this latest action by President Biden. So, yeah, it's coming from both sides of the aisle, and it's equally damaging and cringeworthy to me because, you know, I still believe in the, in the civil and criminal justice system. And I, I believe that there are able people in there who try to do right by the Constitution and by notions of fair play and to, to have these pardons exercised in a way that uh, it, it essentially for someone like Hunter Biden becomes a get out of jail free card that can be used at any time. Um, there's just something uh, that's uh, an anathema to, to what, what we believe to be a, a bedrock of our, of our country. But it's more pernicious than that too, in the sense that we have, it's, it's baked into the cake with the media as well. There'll be a decision that comes down. And the first thing we hear is that it was a Trump appointed judge or it was an Obama appointed yes. judge. And the presumption is that, that the judges have their thumb on the scales, that they are not in fact blind to, to, to yeah, matters. And, of... and all I can do, John, is say is that in my personal and professional experience dealing with judges who were elected, who had uh, affiliations with political parties and dealing and knowing people in the Department of Justice, uh, these folks, by and large, try to do right. Uh, they try they, they take their oath seriously to the state and federal constitution, uh, and they try to apply the law equally and fairly to all. Uh, and I think that can be safely said about a vast majority of the people who work uh, in the court system. But you're right. Uh, there just continues to be a further chipping away of uh, that sort of, of sense of fairness that uh, we, we try to hold to when it comes to our court systems. And I, I worry about that. Attorney at law, Joe Ferretti, our guest here on the program, as we've been discussing the Biden pardon of his uh, son, Hunter. Uh, I, I'm thinking to myself, if, if I'm Joe Biden and I'm leaving office, do I do this? And my answer is 100 percent yes. I don't even bat an eye, and I think he knew a long time ago that he was going to do this. Uh, Bill Clinton was involved in some very controversial pardons that were connected with his family as well as he went uh, out of office. Um, there was uh, a pardons issued by Donald Trump that included his, what was it, the, the father of his, I, I guess, there was a, Mr. Kushner, whatever. Yeah, Kushner, yeah. whatever his. Yeah, Charles Kushner. Yeah, yeah. There, was a re, there was a relationship there. Should be ambassador to France. Yes, and he's, he's about to be appointed <laughs> somewhere. So the, the pardons in regards to the justice system really are, I don't know that they're necessarily based on a political thought so much of it is as a belief. If you believe that the person that you're pardoning was unjustly targeted or accused, 
then you're, you're going to pardon that person if you have the power to do it, it would seem. And if that person well, is your child, you, it's probably a slam dunk. I mean, if I got a chance to pardon my son from going to jail and I'm the president on my way out and I'm 82 or 83 years old, however old Biden is, this is not even something I need to discuss. <laughs> yeah, but sure. that's not where the damage is done, Rob. It's not the I don't think it's the absolute value of the pardon. That is that's problematic in itself. But it's the 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 letter that went with it mm-hmm. th- that that's where the damage is. Well, I'm not telling you this is in the best interest of the country because it's not. But I'm talking about what I would do oh, as a dad, as a dad, if, oh, yeah. if my son was in the crosshairs. Yeah, the, 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 the rationale for pardons is probably as numerous as the pardons themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I mean, go back to George Washington. He, he pardoned. Uh, uh, it's kind of interesting. Insurrectionist uh, Rob in, in Pittsburgh who were upset about uh, taxes against whiskey. Remember the whiskey rebellion? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the first exercise of presidential pardons and george washington's uh idea behind it was noble he wanted to show the country the 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 fledgling country that the federal authority was going to be paramount and if there was going to be a tax on whiskey by god you were going to pay it and he sent thirteen thousand troops to pittsburgh to enforce that notion uh but you know down through the years uh you know like you, you referenced bill clinton with his brother who was trafficking cocaine uh to uh George Bush, 41, uh, pardoning the uh, Iran Contra people, including Cap Weinberger. Um, you know, there's been uh, Jefferson Davis was pardoned uh, for his part in the in the Civil War. So uh, there's been a lot of controversy over the the centuries about pardons, and I, I don't think the, uh, this one's going to be any different. It'll be left to the history books to judge. Uh, whether it was right or wrong, and my fear is that it's going to be uh, a further erosion of the public trust in our court system. Joe, do you pardon your son on the way out the door in a similar situation? Uh, I would be hard-pressed not to, especially because the man taking office has, has made it very clear on the stump speeches that he gave for the last two years that uh, you know he, he is everybody's retribution. And, and I think there would be a fear that he would come after uh, – Hunter Biden uh, for other things, um, and uh, he's installing people in the FBI and other places that are inclined to do his bidding. So I, I think that fear would be would be paramount. Matt, you par- you pardon your son on the way out? I don't know. I'm sitting here thinking about it. I mean, that the, there are consequences to actions, and that's one of the things we try to teach our children. And this is an adult man who made some some dumb decisions. John Gilstrap. Um, I'm with Matt while he was sober. Yeah, I probably would. But I would. The burden of history is tough. That's hard as president. I don't know. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Okay, fellas. Have a good one. Take care. Nine o'clock. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg.